Judy Jaffe, thank you for meeting us today here in the studio. And thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. I like what you're doing with thank the you. art magazine. Thank you so much. Well, you know, I, I think you first got on my radar, I don't know, maybe a couple months ago when I saw on Spinello's um, Instagram like a preview that must have come from your stop motion film, yes. Alice in Dystopia. Uh, where you see the hand, her hand, yes. and the sprout come out of her hand. Correct. Uh, and I was like, wow, that's so cool. I can't believe. It. And then I just kept looking and seeing all the different things you do. Um, can you tell me how you got started in art and what was your first, I guess, uh, as far as you know, you do so much, what was the first discipline that you kind of latched onto? Well, I started actually in archaeology and anthropology. Really? That's what I was interested huh. in. And so, and that is connected to what my art's connected to now as well. Um, the first things I started doing were drawings, and then I really focused on clay for a long time mm -hmm. and went to grad school. You know, then I, I lived in Philly and taught at a university there mm -hmm. and was teaching sculpture. So I've learned all different kinds and work in all different kinds of materials and also stop motion. So I work in 2D, 3D, and mm -hmm. stop motion. And uh, what school did you go to? For undergrad, I went to Tyler uh -huh. School of Art. And for graduate school, I went to Alfred University okay. in New York State. Wow, wow. And wh where did you teach up there? University of the Arts in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And I also taught in China at Xi'an Academy of Fine Arts for five years okay. um, during the fall term. Are you still teaching down here? No, okay. I'm not. No, now I'm really focusing on my work. Okay, yeah. Well, you mentioned a connection with FAU. What's your... Um... Well, I am part of the international program for the Jaffe Center for Book Arts, which my father started. Really? And it's part of the library there, and it's about artist books. Okay, so that's a whole other thing, a whole other aspect of my life, yeah. I went to FAU, I graduated... Oh, you're kidding. No, no, I graduated from FAU in 99 with a degree in sociology. Oh, that's so And cool. I love anthropology. Um, um, well, I, that's what I got my AA degree in. <laughs> well, so. I think one of the themes in my work... The, the I'm familiar are, with the Joppy Book Center. Center. Oh, yeah, that's most it. Definitely. Yeah, I'm definitely... Because yeah. I, I showed, I actually, when I was teaching, I started having... My father started with prints. And then um, I started teaching a class where I asked them to think about what a book could be, and metaphorically. So it's two ends and a serial kind of activity. And they came up with some great things, and he got interested in book arts there. Oh. And in terms of uh, the sociology, anthropology, archaeology, I feel that that has really led to some of the themes in my work, mm -hmm. which I started mentioning to you, which are, how do we become who we are? And the work um, takes a look at pre-verbal experiences, mm -hmm. forms that are fusions of things, not this or that. But before we define things through language and say, this is that, and that's how you relate to it, mm -hmm. um, I think children, before they have language, look at the world around them and try to understand it through everything they take in from their own bodies to other things in the world. And they make comparisons and try to fuse things together. So I've looked at, um, done a lot of work with preverbal mm -hmm. forms and experiences to try to get a viewer to um, re-enter that part of their own experience mm -hmm. that's not so um, mediated by language. Mm -hmm. And then I've also then moved into looking at stories that we're told once we enter language, we get very conditioned by mm -hmm. it. We're conditioned how we're supposed to think, feel, what a thing is, how we're supposed to relate to it, all of that. So um, part of what's here in the studio is one on Alice in Dystopia, mm -hmm. where Alice and the rabbit go down the wrong rabbit hole and end up in 2020 and have to reassess who they need to be and how the world is going to function now. Mm -hmm. So those are the two things that I really explore in the work that's here in the studio. And a lot of the work that you had uh, in your last solo show 
was it sort of, I know that you had sort of Alice's head and her, yes. her legs and feet. Oh, so, so what I had was, we, when you first enter, at, um, Spinello did, uh, Anthony did a great job with the curation of it because when you first enter this space, there's like a threshold space where there's a spiraling hands, kind of like the caduceus, but with hands instead of with snake heads and flying birds and some other things and, and a little poem. bit of language yeah. and the poem. Yeah. And that's all from children's, uh, the Lord's Prayer, mm -hmm. uh, I Pledge Allegiance, Lullabies, um, Ring Around the Rosy. But there are parts, if you want me to say the poem, I can. Sure. Okay, it, the poem was called and the show was called Before I Sleep. Mm -hmm. And that comes from the Lord's Prayer and it's If I Should Die Before I Wake. Okay, um, so uh, before I wake, before so that I'm, that's I'm sorry, I made a mistake there. Before I wake, yeah. so that's the name of the show, and that was also the poem. And then it goes, mm -hmm. I pledge allegiance when the bow breaks, spilt milk, my soul to take, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. So it's really snippets from what children are taught. So. Um, I pledge allegiance is how one learns to identify with a nation, a country. Mm -hmm. When the bow breaks is a lullaby, but it's actually a haunting lullaby because when the uh, bow breaks, the cradle will fall and down will come cradle baby and all. Spilt milk, don't cry over spilt milk. And then uh, my soul to take, which is if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Mm -hmm. And then Ashes, Ashes, We All Fall Down is from uh, the Ring Around the Rosie, and that's really about the bubonic plague. And that's where everybody was burned, the ashes, and they threw the ashes and had a posy. Mm -hmm. So that was the introduction room. Mm -hmm. Then the next room was the stop motion animation mm -hmm. of Alice. And then there were two other rooms where there were sections from Alice, like a big hand yes. from the one section you mentioned, and Alice's head enlarged, and a large pair of legs, and it was to play off so that you could have multiple experiences by remembering that film, because one way we kind of contribute to who we become is we layer our experiences. So we kind of have one experience and then they reverberate and echo. So these were to echoes of some of the other, the film that you just saw. And um, they were enlarged, very large, bigger than life, way bigger than life, so that that referred back to what happened in actual Alice in Wonderland. And I think one of the things that's being questioned there is, what is my right size? What is my place? What, what, what's the appropriate thing? Yeah. So anyway, and then the, there was a room with bronzes that were pre-verbal. Yes. Then there was a huge room with a whole um, kind of hieroglyphics of pre-verbal forms and strings. The yeah, yeah. The, they were hanging Part, from body this. Parts. They were body parts and fusions of things. Some of them, for example, there was one that was kind of like a pair of breasts, but it also looked like a pair of eyes, and it also with a, it had little extensions coming out, so it also looked like the head of some kind of um, pop culture, uh, you know, form. Mm -hmm. So it, it, they were a lot of things, and there, and it took up the whole room. It just went the mm -hmm. whole way around the room, so that people could kind of begin to read them mm -hmm. and reassess for themselves their own sets of associations. Mm -hmm. Then there was a room of wooden pieces yes. that were also um, from the pre-verbal, but bringing together some of those words and making entities out of them. Mm -hmm. And then there was the second floor, which was um, mostly portrait heads in clay mm -hmm. and that referred back to um, some of the ideas down below. For example, a couple of the portrait heads, you could look through the mouth and see out the eyes of the other. Mm -hmm. So it was like not looking at an object, but looking through mm -hmm. through it and kind of fusing. Wow. It's really interesting uh, how much thought you put into 
and, and piecing it all together because it's my understanding it's some of this work kind of you know dates back some time absolutely it, it was like almost 30 years worth of work and you know um anthony kind of decided which work mm -hmm. to pull from all that because i have a lot more other work i'm sure and so it was a, a lot of his curation was excellent in terms of really putting it together and having it work as one whole. Uh, a lot and that was of, studio visits with you? Yes, he did. Of, yeah. He did a couple studio visits and we talked about the work and he was very enthusiastic and very receptive and I felt he understood it. Mm -hmm. uh, the work isn't simple to understand. Uh, it's not something that's uh, extremely familiar. Mm -hmm. It's a little... Um, um, off the beaten track, mm -hmm. okay, which I like. I like idiosyncratic work, I do. Uh, I think that's what I look for. When I look at work, I look for things that are provocative mm -hmm. to me. Um, so it's not about comfort, but about provocation mm -hmm. a little bit and curiosity. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we, we did that and um, just tried to have work that would speak to each other over the ages and one of the things a number of people have said that I found interesting is you couldn't tell what was early and late. Right. No. You really couldn't. I'm sure um, you, I'm sure you forget sometimes. <laughs> I, yeah. Well, I play off of some of the same ideas. Yeah. That it's not repetitious sure. because they were very different, but they have similar a lot of the work that I do actually is from reading. Yeah. I love to read. Oh, wow. I love to read. Yeah. And um, I read a lot of philosophy and psychology, mm -hmm. sociology, yeah. history. Well, being that your father is uh, part of the uh, Jaffe yeah. uh, book uh, center. center, that's yeah. uh, probably a big influence on you. From from, uh, yeah, and I think also what I was a child that liked time by myself. Mm -hmm. and. We lived not far from the woods, so I'd go in the woods, and when I was home, I'd read. Hmm. Very cool. Yeah, so that's kind of, and that, that became, reading, I guess, really became extremely satisfying mm -hmm. to me and extremely important to uh, understanding the world and understanding myself in the world and trying to understand other people and how society functions and you know I think those are why I was interested in those particular subject mm -hmm. matters mm -hmm. and how do you decide if you're gonna work say in ceramics or in wood or bronze um, yeah it's a good question <laughs> um, well I actually started with a cast paper which mm -hmm. are those partly because I was hit by a car I had done a lot of work in mm -hmm. ceramics but at the time I was living on a fourth floor walk up in New York and I couldn't keep working in clay mm -hmm. So I had to figure out a lightweight material to work in. So I worked on that for a while, and that was necessity. And I guess the other materials are like, each material allows you to do certain things. Mm -hmm. Clay is very responsive. I love clay, it's my favorite. Um, it just really, it's a dialogue, because you can do certain things. It, it works well in compression, does not work well in extension, mm -hmm. okay? and it breaks easily in extension. So there's certain kinds of forms that lend themselves to that. Mm -hmm. um, the same with wood. It's a reductive instead of adding and subtracting, mm -hmm. which clay is adding and subtracting. And bronze, I love working in because it's wax, which is a soft material like um, clay, but it, it's permanent forever, mm -hmm. so it can go outside. So each thing has its different capacities. What do you think is the most challenging to work with? That's a good question. The bronze, maybe. I don't know, I'm guessing. No, I think really? actually the wood. Really? Yeah. yeah. Wood's much more, there are many more steps. I mean, there are a lot of steps in bronze, but any material for me mm -hmm. that I can model is easy. So wax is, mo you can model yeah. with it, and clay you can model. The reductive fact of the... It's the reductive is a different kind of thing. If you take too much away, mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah. You've got to alter Read, the whole thing the, yeah and then resin i've also started recently blowing things up and working larger in resin because mm -hmm. it's lightweight mm -hmm. but it can be placed outside for short periods of time mm -hmm. have you done any sort of um say um 
I guess, art in public places? Like you know, I haven't, but yeah. that's something I'm thinking mm. about now. This large piece behind mm -hmm. you, I think, would be beautiful as mm. a public art piece. And this was done for Deering for outside okay. work. Wow. So I have started playing with outdoor mm -hmm. public work. Mm -hmm. And um, gosh, uh, you mentioned your love of reading. Is there, uh, aside from Alice in Wonderland, was there any other books that influenced some of the work that you can mention that, yeah, that come I, to mind? I really love, um, I actually like looking at language, like uh, in China, it's pictographs mm -hmm. that then led to the characters. Um, the other thing, I love uh, Lacan and psychology about um, the relationship between how language is a double-edged sword. It allows us to communicate, but it also alienates us from our uh, more immediate experiences. Mm -hmm. and. Um, so, it, and then in psychology, I like almost everybody. I like uh, reading and philosophy. Deleuze and Guattari, I think, are really interesting. And uh, Guattari just wrote a book recently about three ecologies where he's talking about internal ecology. He doesn't call it that, but that's basically what I think it is, or at least in my mind it is. Uh, that things outside aren't going to change until things inside change, mm -hmm. and that those things have to develop simultaneously. So that's very connected to what I'm trying to do with my work, mm -hmm. where taking people back and fusing the parts that have been left behind. Because mm -hmm. right now we've privileged so much language and kind of a linear thinking um, that we've left out other ways of knowing mm -hmm. that are extremely important. Like intuition, it's a way of knowing. Yeah. It's a different thing, it's a body way. Or if you, you know, how, let's say, the difference between even a Zoom uh, conversation and one in person. When in person, you can pick up the body language mm -hmm. much more carefully, the quality of uh, the sound, how somebody moves, you can see it on the screen. It's not the same, it's not the same. Um, so it's other ways of knowing uh, that need to be, we need to kind of um, refuse all of our levels mm -hmm. instead of separating them out. It's sort of like indigenous cultures tapping back into... Absolutely, actually. Yeah. My next stop motion that I'm doing with Deering actually is about the Indian removal act of 1830, mm -hmm. which I've already started on with the characters, and that's a whole story. Will that be with marionettes as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it's this, uh, when I moved to Florida about seven years ago now, I got really interested in the uh, history here. And I went up to St. Augustine, and I saw the place where Osceola had been captured, mm -hmm. the fort, and then I got into the whole history of what happened with the Seminoles and um, uh, you know the indigenous populations down here um, and I found out that well basically what you had when Spain owned Florida mm -hmm. um, a, a lot of slaves from Georgia came down because it w was illegal to have slaves here mm -hmm. and so they worked with some of the Seminole tribes and um, became a kind of, they were called Black Seminoles. And there was one woman that Andrew Jackson wanted Florida because a lot of the slave owners wanted their slaves back and the only way they could get them back is by um, taking over Florida. So he was insistent on getting rid of all the indigenous populations here. So he did the Indian Removal Act where everybody had to move west of the Mississippi. A lot of folks went to Oklahoma, right? Yeah, that's why there's so many reservations Trail out west. Yeah. yeah, the Trail of Tears. But the Seminoles and the uh, Miccosukee stayed here and there were some wars, the Seminole Wars. And there was one woman, um, Catherine Beecher, who was the sister of Harriet Beecher Stowe, mm -hmm. who petitioned Congress with the first women's movement in America to 
uh, not remove indigenous populations. It was unethical to do that. And um, during the Seminole Wars, the way they captured Osceola, who was the, um, one of the leaders leading the wars, was by uh, in St. Augustine flying a, fall, a false flag of truce. Mm -hmm. And he came under the impression that there was going to be a discussion and they captured him. Wow. And so the Seminoles moved down to the Everglades and at that point uh, the United States or didn't, America didn't want the Everglades. Mm -hmm. So they were left alone and continued there. So yeah. basically I'm trying to do the next stop motion animation about that. That's interesting. That's a great story. To tell. It's a really, and what I've found is a lot of people that live in Florida don't know that whole mm -hmm. history. And it is part of the history mm -hmm. here that's, you know, and especially coming from the North, what we're taught about American history is very different than what happens down oh, here. Sure, yeah. So you have a very different Florida history than you have, like I was in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania history. I guess, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Whoever has certain power can rewrite history. And Absolutely. And I that, mean, yeah. you really have to dig sometimes, what they call in, in anthropology, talking about triangulating. Um, I, love, I love the thought um, that you're going with. Well, that's kind of why I did Alice in Dystopia. I've done other ones of re-examining stories because that's the only way we get our agency mm -hmm. back is to re-examine stories we're told yeah. and think about how it could be rewritten sure. because it's always written by the people in power. Yeah. And if you rethink them, you can kind of create a new future, yeah. a new future story. Big time, yeah. No, nowadays with the technology and you know the different methods of you know social media and things, it's just there's a lot of bad information out there and people aren't really verifying it, triangulating, you know? Right, yeah, and it's gonna get worse. It's getting worse and worse. It, it will be worse. worse with AI. There won't be in a way, there's not gonna be a way to know what is real and not when it's not real. There won't be that differentiation anymore. It goes back to your thought about intuition and looking inwards. Yeah, and actually, these, that's a good point. You know. Yeah, that will be, I don't, I haven't even thought about how AI experiences would impact that. That's really a good point. Well, I wanted to ask you about um, your experiences in China. How, how has that influenced your work at all? You know, you did mention the pictographs and things like that, but um, you, well, you were there teaching. Um, did you like pick up anything from the culture that has influenced your work, would you say? Or? Well, not, not so much that influenced my work, but I got to see some really very, very old ruins mm -hmm. and, you know, archaeological spots. The terracotta warriors were right outside of the city I was mm -hmm. in. And there are many, many more mounds that aren't as well known. And then in the northwest along the um, Silk Route, there are all kinds of mountains with Buddhist um, figures inside. Mm -hmm. And they're just amazing, amazing devotional objects and amazing sights, like from a dream. They're very much from this other world. Yeah. They're very much um, from a spiritual world. And um, I love that. I, that to me is more interesting than most of what happens on daily life. I just sure. find that stuff really interesting. Plus, I got to work with, I had the students work some of, with some of their own myths from mm -hmm. the Chinese culture into installations and in stop motion, and that was interesting too, because I got to learn a little bit about some of the mythology. Mm -hmm. Really cool. Yeah. So when you were teaching, you incorporated stop motion as well? as Yes, I did. Ceramics and... Yes. Oh, no, I had them do, I was hired mostly to do installation okay. and uh, multidisciplinary. Oh. So I was able to do installations and then also stop motion because on there, they had at the time on their phone something that could capture stop motion uh -huh. a lot easier than, I always do it with my, uh, with film and, you know, Adobe Premiere and uh -huh. all of that. They had things on their phone, some kind of program on their phone that w made it a lot easier, oh, wow. a mu much more seamless mm -hmm. for them. And so they could make the things out of anything they want and then animate them. Wow, 
That sounds like a lot of fun. It was. You had it a lot was of fun a lot with of these fun. kids. I yeah. did. <laughs> and uh, when was the last time you went there? Would you ever We're, like to go back again? Um, right. I have not been back since the pandemic. Okay. And I don't know if I'd like, I mean, there's so many other places I'd love to see. Mm -hmm. I'd love to go to India. Mm -hmm. um, there's similar never been. sort of cultural sites there that have that exactly larger than life. Correct. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I love China. It was, I felt incredibly safe there. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a very different culture than ours. I mean, I've been, I've spent some time in Asia, I've been to Japan, I did an artist residency there, and Japan is very different than China. China, in some ways, was more like America to me, in terms of um, being a little rougher than, than Japan, in terms of manners and all of that yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> People are overly nice in Japan, I guess. Well, they're very courteous <laughs> yeah. and very thoughtful because community, the other, is import, as important as you are. So there's a sense of always, um, in some ways, very overly polite. For example, um, on, well, just even traveling on the trains and stuff, the level of quiet was incredible, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and, it was just, there's always the concern for the other. Mm -hmm. And that's not so great here, and it's not so great in China. Yeah, oh, interesting. You know, every place is so interesting. Oh, yeah. it, all these different cultures, and I think one of the things I liked about teaching in China is it brought me back to archeology. span oh. It was like my way of fusing my interest in, in uh, art and in history and in archeology. span so cool. And because, you know, in archaeology, what people value is what they make. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, we make assumptions about what must have been valued. Um, and it's just fascinating to me, what do people value? And what does our culture value? And why? And what does that do? How does what we value impact who we become? Mm -hmm. That's the big question for me in my work. I'll, yeah, I'd say that's the big question. I guess these are the things we find in discovering digs and things like that. Correct. The artifacts. And, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. The, the way that, gosh, for example, the Egyptians were buried with all sorts of Correct. jewelry and what have you. They were pets. They were yeah. <laughs> it's, well, even in China, they, they originally, some of those tombs, they actually killed everybody with the emperor mm -hmm. and buried everyone. And then with the um, ceramics, they put in uh, substitutes for mm -hmm. the real people mm -hmm. when the emperor died. So there are all kinds of things around how one lives in life and mm -hmm. how one dies and all of that um, in all of these cultures. So the issue of, you know, what what is value becomes so important that's very cool <laughs> when is your um uh, exhibit at the deering estate taking place can uh, you tell that, us that i think is going to be 2025. okay okay and so. are, is it going to be more than the film that you're making um, um it's going to be the film probably the marionettes and some um uh, what i also made were some um fabric panels that tell the story of each of the characters mm. and the history of this state of during that time. Oh, okay. So, really cool. Yeah. That's going to be amazing. I can't wait to... It will be interesting. It will be very different. Yeah. Do you have a title History's for it? History's harder. Mm -hmm. No, I don't yet. I was I'm trying to think. It's something about resistance, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not sure what yet. It's There's still time for it to be uncovered. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. It, it develops as you go. I'm sure, yeah. And any other shows that you have coming up that you want to talk about? Or? Trying to think. Nothing immediately coming to mind. The no. one at Spinello was absolutely amazing. It oh, just, thank you. Yeah. Did you go and I, see it? I went, yeah, I loved oh, it. Oh, I'm so yeah. glad you saw it. I feel like I could have spent more time there. <laughs> well, thank you for going. No, I'm great. so glad. Yeah. I wish I had been there when you were there. I could oh, yeah. have walked you through it. Yeah. yeah. Well, a lot of your stuff is here. You can still... Uh... Yeah, I can still do it. <laughs> Correct, I can. Certain things, I'm sure. No, and you've talked, you've talked about a lot of them. Uh, the paper casting process, is that kind of like paper mache? No, what it is, is the forms are modeled in clay, mm -hmm. then there's a plaster mold made, 
and then you get cotton linter, so it's archival. And, what, and you put a hardener called methyl cellulose in there, and then you pulverize it all. And then it's broken into tiny little fibers, and then you press all the water out. It takes a long time, over and over. Mm. And as you press, the fibers condense again. And it makes them really strong. If you want to touch it, yeah. it's really strong. Like a rock. It's Well, it looks like a rock. It does but look like a rock. <laughs> it's actually one of the stronger materials because if it falls, it doesn't break like mm -hmm. ceramics does. It's lightweight and it's non-toxic to work with. Oh, I've I, never heard of that process before. It's really neat. Well, like I said, I kind of had to develop it yeah. when I had, was hit by the car because mm -hmm. that was I needed something lightweight. Yeah. And non-toxic. I have birds mm -hmm. where I work at home, and you know I don't want toxic materials. Sure, sure. Yeah. You do all this work at home. I did um, all of. I, I do. I do the smaller pieces yeah. all at home. What about the bigger? Well, ones? these these ones I have had um, CNC printed now mm -hmm. from smaller pieces. Oh, okay. So now I can take smaller, like the large Alice head was actually from the marionette. Wow. And then you can blow it up. Amazing. So that's a new technology, uh, and, you know, that beca and I had tried to learn it years ago of scanning. With scanning, you have to take pictures, of, you know, all 360 degrees and then weave them together. Now there's probably easier ways, easier methods for scanning. Mm -hmm. And once a form is scanned, you can alter it, you can change the size, mm -hmm. and then it can be cut out. Mm. and print it out. Very cool, very cool. And that's I would have never guessed that's what that was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, it, well, again, it's um, become cheap enough to do. Yeah. It wasn't originally. And also, it's a way to work large scale because to make something like that, let's say, model it, make a mold, mm -hmm. something really big, it's heavy. Oh, yeah. It's heavy and a lot of labor and a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And um, so... The bronzes were made that way, but now I can take a bronze form and have a bronze. Mm -hmm. And this wood, can you tell me about how you work that out? I mean, it's just so beautiful and so smooth. Thank you. That basically, again, was I made models, and um, I actually had one of my students laminate all the wood. The wood is laminated. Mm -hmm. So what you do, you don't get a, a solid piece. You can see right in there the laminations. Mm -hmm. And you cut out the shapes, the basic shapes, and then put glue in between mm -hmm. and put pressure on it so it really hangs together. It, takes form, right? it yeah. takes form. And then you cut out, rough cut it, and then you sand it and carve it, and then sand it and sand it and sand it. So there's a lot of sanding. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you want it smooth. And then these were finished with like a stain instead mm -hmm. of paint. Oh, yeah. So you can still see the wood. The grain. Yeah, the grain of the wood and all. Um, but I, I think to me it's the hardest. Mm. It's beautiful. Because of the lamination and the weight and the rough cutting and mm -hmm. the, all of that. It's That's a lot. Yeah. Wow. It's so nice to talk to you and learn about you and your process. Um, I can't wait to see your next project. It sounds really interesting. I love the uh, concept with uh, Florida's indigenous history and uh, definitely uh, going to look forward to, to seeing that. Thank you. And thank you so much for inviting me. And it was so nice meeting you. Really too. nice to meet yeah. you too. Yeah. Really I great. hope we can stay in touch. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jean. Thank you. <laughs>